Well, hello, and welcome to our REACH Conference 2021. Uh, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Brian Elliott. I'm one of the associate ministers here uh, with the John Street Church of Christ, and I'm excited to uh, be here today to share with you uh, this idea about an oikocentric care ministry and what it means to uh, care for people in an oikocentric way. And, and remember, oikocentric is focusing in on this oikos that we all have, these 8 to 15 people that God has strategically and supernaturally placed in our lives who we may come into contact with every day, uh, every week, once a month, whatever it may be, but people who uh, we walk alongside with and who are in our lives, people who may be, and we'll review this card right quick, some of those may be pre-Christians, uh, those who have not yet placed their faith in Jesus, people that they may be believers, they may have just not given their lives over to Christ. Uh, we have prodigals, those who are believers, those who uh, have confessed their faith in Jesus, but they're not actively pursuing it. They have, uh, maybe they're not uh, regular attenders at church or, or they've kind of fallen away. Uh, we also have the purposefuls, which are those people within our circles that are very active in their faith, that are working um, diligently in some body of believers in some church. And then uh, finally, we have our potentials. And our potentials are those who kind of are just keep showing up in our lives more often, people that uh, we may think or, or perceive that God is putting on our hearts, that the Spirit is... Um, kind of moving us to have some kind of interaction with them, uh, to be able to minister to them, to pray for them, whatever it, whatever it may be. So what we're going to look today is, is this idea of care ministry. And typically, when you think of care ministry, you, we, we probably tend to think in crisis situation. When someone's in a crisis, we want to reach out and we want to help them. But the reality is, is that um, care can be any time, any day, any place, in any one of these situations that we may have with these people that are within our oikos. There's always opportunities to reach out, to help, to care for, to walk with those uh, as we all travel down this journey that we call life. One thing about care, it is very relational. Uh, so when you think about those people who are around you every day or every week or maybe once a month, whatever it may be, these are people that you have some kind of a relationship with, whether that's a very intimate relationship where uh, you guys are, are good friends, you're good buddies, you share a lot of things together, or whether it's the clerk at the store or whoever it may be who you simply know kind of by face, you, you see them on a regular basis. Um, but these are all opportunities that we have sometimes naturally. We may fall into these situations where we can reach out and help somebody, sometimes unnaturally, uh, where we sort of just kind of, I don't know if push ourselves in, but just sort of invade maybe uh, someone's space. Uh, but remember that any one of these people can fall within these four um, uh, people groups that are within our oikos. So what we want to do today, what I want to do today is I want to carry us through a project. Uh, we want to build a, a house or a building, if you will. And this handout is available on your app. Uh, if you'll go to your app and look up, uh, I think it's under media, uh, look under reach, and uh, you pull up that page and you'll find all of the class notes and the handouts uh, that are available to you for um, as you work through these different classes that we're offering. So the first thing we're going to do when we build a house is we want to lay a foundation. So what is our foundation? What is an oikocentric ministry built on? What is our purpose? Okay, that's what we need to identify. And I think that's a fairly clear answer that our purpose is basically to care for people. That's what we want to do. We want to always be trying to meet the needs of people 
but also keeping them pointed toward God and what God may be trying to do in their lives. Louis Giglio said, God's plans for your life far exceed the circumstances of your day. So now we're not going to immediately come out with this. I've got a plan here. But we know those of us, and even those of us with strong faith, when we get into predicaments, sometimes we, we stop and we wonder. But we know that God has bigger plans for us than what we may be living in this moment. Margaret Feinberg said, always remain suspicious that God is up to something good. Uh, and we can look to Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good for those who... Um, put their faith and trust in Christ Jesus. So God, there is a bigger picture. And, and, and part of our job is, is caring people, uh, taking care of people, is not only trying to, to tend to their needs, but it's also try to help them remember what is God doing, uh, what may be God doing, how is God working in this particular situation. One of the things that, um, you know, when, when people are in crisis, Pretty much all they see is the crisis. I like to take the uh, old saying, uh, you can't see the forest for the trees. <laughs> Excuse me. And I like to revert that and say, you can't see the trees for the forest. And so when we're in the middle of a crisis, we can't see all the little bitty things. All we see is just this big mess that's, that's kind of sitting on top of our shoulders. So part of our job as, as carers or as care ministers is at some point to come in and help these people who may be in a crisis, if the, if the crisis is what it is, is try to help them figure out uh, to, to kind of focus back in and see the different trees uh, to help them uh, change uh, their lives or accept uh, what is going on, how, they, how they, they, can, they can work through it, but also how ultimately that... Um, uh, they're coming around may be a change in the world for Christ that because of something they've been through or because of what they're going through at some point they may be able to turn around and help somebody else not only go through their particular situation but influence them for Jesus bring them to know Christ give them a purpose to turn around and go out and do the same thing Jesus and several of the New Testament writers were very instrumental in helping us understand that um, an oikos is relational and that we tend to connect with people in a relational way. In Matthew 9, 53, uh, sorry, that should be 35 through 38, Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I know many of you have probably heard this, especially that last verse there, the last part of 38 quoted in a very evangelistic or uh, missional, missionary type sense is we are the, the, the fields are white into harvest we're to go out and we're to evangelize folks and yes I'm not taking away from that but I think that, that our evangelism can also look very different in that in this particular case Jesus says he had compassion on them he knew that they had a need they were being harassed and they were helpless he was telling his disciples, I'm going to go help them. I want you to go do the same. I want you to go meet their needs. Um, and then as you're meeting their needs, if you can bring them around to acceptance of Christ, great. Uh, that is certainly our ultimate goal. But our initial goal is to help meet the needs. And so... As we begin to look at our house, so we have our foundation, we have our purpose, and then we're going to start putting up our columns, okay, or our pillars, uh, the pillars of the culture, if you will, what this oikocentric uh, care ministry looks like. What does it involve? 
Well, and one of the things I want to uh, make, make you aware of is every one of these words, there's going to be four columns, are going to end in, I, they're, they're verbs, and they're going to end in ing. And ing, the, the ing ending means that this is an ongoing process. This is not something that we just do, and once it's done, it's over. This is something that we're going to be doing over and over again. So the very first one is connecting. Uh, we're going to connect. We need to connect to the people in order to be able to have some kind of impact, some kind of effect in their lives. And what is the most important thing in trying to connect to someone? The most important thing is listening. We need to listen to what their situation is. If we don't listen, if we immediately try to start fixing or try to help them try to figure out maybe what the next step is they're going to tune us out we're not going to have any luck and it's just going to we're, everything's going to fall flat on our faces proverbs eighteen thirteen says that to answer before listening that is folly and shame so listen also james 1 19 my dear brothers and sisters take note of this everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak so what people are looking for, what people want is they want validation, they want compassion, they want uh, understanding to some, to some uh, degree. They want to know that what they're feeling and what they're thinking is okay, that it's normal. Uh, again, I said they don't want to be fixed. If we go in and start saying things like, well, you know, God is in control or, or this is going to be okay. Everything's going to work out fine. Or, you know, I know, I know what you're going through, kind of things like that. We're going to tune them out because, I mean, unless you've been there and maybe some of us actually have, we have no idea what they're going through. So the best thing to do in the beginning to connect is just to simply listen. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to um, assess, excuse me. And assessing is where we're going to ask some, um, well, Proverbs 25, the purposes of a person hard are deep waters, but one who has insight draws them out. So we, we're going to ask some, some kind of some introspective questions um, we're, we're just simply wanting to try to understand the story a little better, understand maybe what happened. Um, again, at this point, we're just sim we're, we're listening and we're assessing. We're not offering any opinions. We're not offering any ideas, solutions, uh, whatever it may be. So part of this assessing process, we can ask questions like, what is happening or how are you responding? Or maybe if it's something that already happened, Excuse me. What did happen, or how did you respond to it? So, what 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 are you going through? How are you reacting to that? Another question that we want to ask is, what are you thinking, and how are you feeling, or what were you thinking, and how are you feeling? And trying to get in tune with their thoughts and their emotions, and and see uh, not only how they're reacting to it but obviously what they're thinking about it and how they're feeling about it. And then the last one there that we want to ask is, what is it that you need or what did you want? What did you need? And, and, and then we're going to begin to kind of determine and figure out, okay, what is it that I can do? What is it that we can do? Whoever it may be to try to help take care of this need uh, and see if there's something that we can begin to do to help this person move from point A uh, to point B. So all throughout the assessment process, we're remaining focused on their needs. Again, we're not trying to fix things, and nor is it about yet what God may be trying to do or change in their life, okay? So it's simply about trying to meet this need and move from point A to point B. The third column uh, is responding responding and this idea of responding is aligning yourself with them and what God may be trying to do in their life so um, and, and, and now then this is where you kind of get hopefully you've 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 
we've done a good job you've done a good job at connecting with them you've established some level of trust uh, you've assessed the situation enough to where you are able to kind of begin to uh, to help them find some practical solutions or whatever it may be to the situation that they're in and then we're going to begin to introduce okay what have you thought about what God may be doing in this particular situation have you thought about where God is in this particular situation and this idea I, 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 it was a great example that was shared with me that, that kind of really helped me sort of understand this but this idea of aligning ourselves if you're familiar with uh, baseball or you play baseball or played baseball if you're an outfielder and a ball comes flying out to the outfield and you have to chase after it well you're turned away from the rest of the infield from home plate because you're chasing after that ball well when you pick that ball up you're going to possibly be disoriented because you don't know exactly where you are or on the field I mean you, you do but but so there's going to be someone between you there's going to be an infielder between you and where you need to aim at throwing the ball that person is aligning themselves with you and and where you need to throw that ball whether it's to throw it directly to them or throw it over them to someone else so what we're trying to be in this uh, particular um phase of, of, of our caring in this responding phase is we're trying to align we're trying to be that infielder who is trying to align them with what God may be doing or trying to do in their lives or trying to bring about in their lives remember the two quotes that we said earlier earlier that God is always up to something good and the circumstances that we're going through now uh, God's God's big picture is much greater than that um, so it's not about trying to convince them of anything. It's simply about asking introspective questions, just, just kind of not really quizzing them, but, but just sort of putting God out there and getting them to start thinking and getting them to start questioning and wondering and, and maybe opening a door, an opportunity for us to be able to uh, bring God in and we're assuming here of course it depends on who the person is obviously if it's a purposeful then you can bring God in pretty much from the very beginning but if it's a prodigal or a potential or even a pre-Christian we probably don't want to come in that forceful with God we want to introduce him gently and slowly um, so that they know that that our we're genuine about what we're trying to do in helping them and not simply trying to sell them uh, something so our final column is encouraging and what what is encouraging evolve what is the most important thing that we can do to encourage people well it's our presence it's being there for them it's it may be it's being present in their lives whether it's calls texts visits emails it's just it's staying in touch with them uh, so that we can continue to walk with them through whatever they are struggling with but also trying to keep them aligned and and help them see what it is that God may be up to Hebrews 3:13 says but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness so there is a command for us to be encouraging those who are uh, that we're in contact with that we may be trying to help through uh, some struggle and encouraging also for me encouraging involves coming back to the other three because as we're encouraging we're coming back to connecting we're listening we're set we're continuing to assess what else can we add what else can we do differently and we're also continuing to respond how can we continue to align them with God and what God may be doing in their lives so it is a it, it's kind of perpetual it's kind of a continue a continuing cycle that goes on and on and on so the last one is our roof and I'm going to call it inspecting and this is probably more for um, 
assuming we have a, a care ministry, which we do, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second of sorts, but um, either that ministry leader or even the staff person maybe that is uh, over that particular ministry, uh, that they're inspecting the ministry and, and, and inspecting from the standpoint of making sure that that ministry is regenerating, okay? Uh, I have a quote here. And this is from a conference that we attended, um, which was about uh, this. It was the National Oikos Conference we attended back in October. It was a virtual conference that uh, the, several of the staff and even some of the uh, couple of elders and some of our members actually uh, joined in. But it says, when care receivers become caregivers, okay, you have an effective care ministry. So when... Um, when I have been cared, when somebody has reached out to me in my struggle and I have been cared for and I have worked through that and I have uh, come through that, when I in turn turn around and then use what I was given or how I was helped to assist somebody else, then we have an effective care ministry. But it becomes Christ exalting when it becomes an oikocentric care ministry and by oikocentric it means it becomes purposeful so we're connecting people with purpose I'm, I'm not only am I helping you work through something but I am equipping you with the ability to go out and find and help someone else whether it's with the same struggle or whether it's something else but you have been given uh, a, a gift or an opportunity or some knowledge or some learning to be able to go out and do something for somebody else and try to help them uh, not only fix or take care of their situation but hopefully bring them closer to God. Second Corinthians <clears throat> excuse me, 1, 3 through 7 says, Praise be to God or to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patience, endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. Now, I was reading through a commentary, and the commentator said that the word comfort was mentioned ten times in these five verses. Well, I only counted nine. Nonetheless, the, the, the Greek word for comfort that Paul uses here is paraklesis. And paraklesis, the root word there is parakle. And if you're familiar at all with the Holy Spirit, with any study we've done on the Holy Spirit, or even you still have an old King James Version of the Bible, the word that you're going to see in there is paraklete or paraclete as we have English, uh, English sized it. Uh, paraclete is, th this idea here is someone who comes alongside, someone who comes uh, and, and walks with you in what you're dealing with or what you're struggling with. It's this um, to treat in an inviting or friendly way to make a strong appeal or exhortation. So again, there's that relational component. It's not something that we can do I mean, we can do it virtually, obviously texts and, and, and phone calls, but at some point there's got to be some, some human contact. I know we're in a pandemic right now and that makes it a little more difficult, so by all means, any way that you can connect is great, but we do need to come alongside these people and we need to walk with them. Queen Elizabeth I was... Um, had a famous saying that's kind of become a, uh, I guess, a quote that a lot of people use. But during World War I, uh, she was known to often visit east, the east end of London, which was the part of uh, London that had received most of the bombing 
uh, from the uh, from the uh, Germans. Uh, most of the damage. She was well liked by her people, and um, was uh, especially those of the East End, and, and certainly they appreciated her visit. But it wasn't until her own home, it wasn't until Buckingham Palace uh, was actually hit by a bomb that she became even more endeared by them. One of her most famous and quoted saying was, at last, I can look the East End in the face. She had suffered something of what they had, of what they had suffered, and the comfort that she brought them uh, by her continued presence was all the more stronger. So it is true that when we have been through something, we are certainly much more equipped to work with someone who is going through that certain something. But that doesn't mean that we all don't have something to give, something to offer, something to help with. When Peter and John were going into the temple, there was a a man, a lame man that was sitting out there and it says uh, he saw they were about to enter. He asked them for money. And Peter looked it straight at him, and as did John. <laughs> Peter said, hey, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Okay? We may not have silver or gold. We may not be able to assist in a financial way. We certainly probably do not have the capability that Peter and John had to, to heal somebody in the moment. But we've all been gifted and we've all been given the same uh, exhortation by God, the same appeal to go out to look at the fields that are widened to harvest, to have compassion on people, to help them. Which brings me to uh, our Compassionate Care Ministry, which is a ministry here at this church that really doesn't get a whole lot of uh, attention. It's kind of a sort of a grassroots movement, but we, uh, we, we have a, it's not a big database, if you will, but, but we have some people who have been through uh, situations in their life who have said, I am willing to walk along somebody who is going through this same situation that I'm in. And so periodically, we'll, we'll kind of put this out there. We'll kind of uh, make it known. And we'll have some people uh, that say, you know what, I'm dealing with this. Do you have anybody that might be able to help me? Or we'll just get a call at the office or, or somebody just in the process of conversation. You realize someone is struggling with a particular issue or situation. You can say, hey... I may know someone who might be able to help you, who might be able to walk with you and actually get in your shoes on this. Would you be open to that? And if they are, then we begin the process. Tannis Price is kind of the the lead over this ministry. Uh, I'm sort of the contact person. There's no exchange of names until both people, both parties agree that it's okay to meet, and then we kind of put them together. Um, But anyway, this uh, this is... a ministry that we do have here um, that we certainly are always open to adding new people to. So I hope that this has been beneficial. I hope that you have uh, gained some knowledge from this. Um, I am uh, will certainly be available for questions. You know how to get a hold of me either uh, via the church email or just call the church office. Um, but please, if you have any questions, uh, direct them to me. I'd be glad to... Um, have a conversation with you on whatever it may be. Thanks again for tuning in and joining me for this presentation. I pray and hope that you have a great day. May God bless you. Goodbye.